The engine combusts fuel, which moves the pistons and crankshaft, creating rotation. The clutch engages or disengages the engine's rotational energy to the transmission. The transmission contains a number of gears, which transfer the power of the engine towards the wheels and enables us to change the speed and the torque of the vehicle. The shaft transfers the power to the rear differential. The rear differential distributes this power to the wheels, causing them to rotate and propel the car along. Manual transmission requires the driver to know exactly when to change gear, which gear to change to, and also operate the clutch pedal to disengage and then re-engage the engine. First of all, we have the main housing. This will protect all the internal components and hold them in place. Looking inside, we have the input shaft, the output shaft, and a counter shaft. A number of gears are fixed to the counter shaft. These will therefore all rotate together. On the input shaft, we also have a gear which is in constant mesh with the counter shaft. The gear teeth are at an angle, which is known as a helical cut. These gear teeth gradually engage on multiple teeth from one side to the other. This distributes the stress on the gears and makes the gear mesh much quieter than a straight cut spur gear. At the other end of the input shaft is the clutch. This will connect to the engine and force the input shaft to rotate. Any time the clutch is engaged with the engine, it causes the input and counter shaft to rotate. There are also a number of different size gears on the output shaft. These are also in constant mesh with the gears on the counter shaft. And so, when the counter shaft rotates, so will the output gears. However, notice that the output shaft does not rotate with the output gears. That's because each output gear sits on a needle bearing. This allows the gear to rotate independently from the shaft. If we look at the output shaft, we see there are a number of spline sections. These are grooves which are cut into the metal. A synchronizer hub fits over the splines. The splines will lock the hub in place so that it will rotate with a shaft. Another component called the synchronizer sleeve will fit over the hub. The outer surface of the hub and the inner surface of the sleeve are both splined. This interlocks the two components. The sleeve can move forwards and backwards on the hub. When the output shaft rotates, so will the hub and the sleeve, but not the output gears. Attached to the channel, on the outside of each of the sleeves, is a shift fork and a shift rod. The rod connects to the gear shifter. The gear shifter moves the rod backwards and forwards, which therefore also moves the fork and sleeve backwards and forwards. On each of the output gears, we find some additional straight cut teeth. These teeth will align with the spline teeth inside the sleeve. When the gear is selected, the teeth inside the sleeve align and interlock with the straight cut teeth on the gear. The gear will now be interlocked with the sleeve and the output shaft. So, when the input shaft rotates, this rotates the counter shaft, which rotates the output gear, and this now rotates the output shaft. When the gear is disengaged, the sleeve returns to its default position, allowing the output gear and the sleeve to rotate independently from each other. The problem we face is that the output shaft and the sleeve are rotating at different speeds to the output gear. So, when we engage the sleeve, the teeth are going to collide and grind. To overcome this, we use a synchronizer blocker ring. It's called this because it will prevent or block the gear from changing until the sleeve and the gear speed are synchronized. The inner edge of the blocker ring is angled and matches the cone on the gear. This allows the blocker ring to easily slide on and off of the gear. We also have some small struts which are inserted into the slots of the hub. These are held in place by a radial spring which pushes them outwards. The sleeve sits over the struts and the hub. A ridge on top of the strut interlocks with the sleeve. The sleeve will move the struts back and forth. There are also some slots cut into the blocker ring. These will align with the struts. The slots are wider than the strut, which allows the blocker ring to rock back and forth a small amount. 
the blocker ring rotates with the hub and the sleeve. When a gear is selected, the sleeve moves towards the gear. This pushes the strut against the blocker ring. The blocker ring rubs against the cone of the gear, causing the blocker ring to rotate until it hits the limit of the slot. The blocker ring's teeth and the sleeve teeth are now out of alignment. This prevents the sleeve from engaging with the gear. As the blocker ring continues to be pushed against the gear cone, the friction generated between the two causes them to synchronize speed and rotate together. The sleeve is then pushed across, moving the blocker ring and allowing the teeth on the sleeve to engage with the straight teeth of the gear. The gear is now synchronized and the clutch can be engaged. To reverse the car, we need to bring the car to a complete stop. An idler gear is then pushed into position with both the output and the counter gear. All three gears are straight cut, which is also known as a spur gear. The idler gear is free to rotate. This allows it to slide into position when the car has stopped. Now the output shaft will rotate in the opposite direction. The engine is going to provide the rotational energy. If we engage the clutch with the car in neutral, the input shaft rotates, causing the counter shaft and the output gears to rotate. The output shaft does not rotate though. For first gear, we disengage the clutch, which stops the engine from adding any further power to the input shaft. Then we push the gear stick so that it moves the sleeve. The blocker ring rubs against the gear hub and uses the friction to synchronize the speed. Once synchronized, the sleeve moves across to interlock the gear to the output shaft. For second gear, we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the first gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the second gear, which pushes the sleeve and blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the second gear. For third gear, we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the second gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the third gear, which pushes the sleeve and blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the third gear. For fourth gear, we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the third gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the fourth gear, which pushes the sleeve and the blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the fourth gear. For fifth gear, we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the fourth gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the fifth gear, which pushes the sleeve and blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the fifth gear. For reverse, we bring the car to a complete stop and disengage the clutch. All of the shafts and the gears come to a stop. We then slide the idler spur gear between the counter and the output gears. Then we re-engage the clutch to reverse the direction of the output shaft. So this is how we use the engine to propel the car along and use gears to go faster. Okay, that's it for this video, but to continue learning about mechanical and automotive engineering, check out one of the videos on screen now and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, as well as the engineeringmindset.com.